Good morning, Freedom Church. It's good to see everyone this morning. I hope and pray that everyone is doing well. And again, to you guests who are here with us, maybe for the first time today or it's been a while, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning as we continue on in our worship of the Lord and also in our Advent series called The Dawn of Hope. And so if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it up, uh, take it out, open it up, maybe turn it on, and uh, turn to Luke chapter 1 with us this morning. Luke chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning as we continue on in this series, The Dawn of Hope. Uh, as you're turning there, uh, I want us to think about something together. If you'll think about it with me, uh, what are some signs that you know of that help is on the way? Can you think of any? Help is on the way. Uh, there can be all kinds of signs that help is on the way, right? Um, a sign that help is on the way can be something serious like the sound of a siren of uh, a fire truck or, or an ambulance letting you know that help is on the way. Or it could be something silly like the smell of dinner cooking on the stove letting you know that help is on the way for your hunger, right? I remember when I was a kid and I was trying to put something together in my bedroom, the sound of my father's footsteps coming down the hallway was a sign that help was on the way. And it can still be like that now that I'm 33. Dad's around, I know that help's on the way. Uh, nowadays, when my wife sends me into food line for the one missing ingredient, and I'm standing there in the soup and the spice aisle looking at all of these things going, what she sent me in here for does not exist. It doesn't exist. And then my phone rings because I'm taking so long, and the kids are going crazy in the car, and she's getting frustrated. That ringing phone is a sign that help is on the way. It may be, may be angry, frustrated, frustrated help, but it's help nonetheless, right? Help is on the way. Well, church, uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at another sign. It's a sign from God. And the sign was a baby boy. And the sign represented the fact that God's help was on the way. He had not forgotten his promises, even though God's people were unworthy. God, in his great mercy, had come to save them anyway. Just like he said he would. And this story is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. And if you're taking notes, this is our main point for this morning. Though we are unworthy, though we are unworthy, the hope of Christ causes us to rejoice in God's mercy. Though we are unworthy, the hope of Christ causes us to rejoice in God's mercy. So if you found your place there, we're going to read verses 57 through 66 together. And then we'll pray and then we'll ask the Lord for his help beginning in verse 57 God's word says this now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her and on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zechariah after his father but his mother answered no he shall be called John and they said to her, But none of your relatives is called by that name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and this is what he wrote. His name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was open, and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all of these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who believed them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. This is God's word, church. Let's pray to the Lord together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for it, not uh, out of rote repetition, Lord, because we really are just thankful that you have spoken, that these things record what you have done in the world for your glory and for the salvation of mankind. God, we thank you for your word. I pray, the Lord, you would help us this morning see what you have to say to us this morning from Luke chapter 1. Uh, Lord, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you help us, Lord, to worship and glorify you for all that you've done, the mercy that you've shown us? We love you, Father, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, we're picking up the story in Luke chapter 1, and if, if you remember how Pastor Aaron talked about several weeks ago, nine months before verse 57 when Elizabeth has this baby boy nine months before that God sent his angel Gabriel 
to tell Zechariah that he and his barren wife, Elizabeth, would have a son in their old age. Now, this was an incredible promise, to say the least, right? Not only were Elizabeth and Zechariah older and past the age of having children, but Elizabeth was barren. She wasn't able to have kids. And so they had not one, but two strikes against them. And so even though they had prayed for a child for years, their hope of a child ever coming was, was long gone by this point. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Zechariah is just doing what he does, working at the temple. Here comes this promise from God through this messenger, Gabriel. Luke 1.13, you remember what Gabriel told Zechariah? Don't be afraid, Zechariah, because he was afraid. Don't be afraid, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. This was the promise nine months ago. Now, we have a hard time trusting God for daily bread, don't we? We have a hard time trusting God in the little things sometimes. And so, as you can imagine, Zechariah had a hard time believing God's promise that this baby boy would actually come. And so God gave Zechariah a sign. And the sign that he gave Zechariah was, you won't be able to talk. And he probably couldn't hear either. This is why they're making signs at him, and he has to write stuff down. For nine months, you'll be silent until you realize and learn that nothing is too difficult for God. And what he says, he means. It comes to pass. And so now here we are, a little over nine months has passed. Elizabeth is ready to have her baby. And what does the Bible say in verse 57? The time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. I love this. Do you hear the simplicity of this verse? It's just simple. The time came, she bore a son. You know, now that God has given me the opportunity to sit in a delivery room a couple of times, I can say that there's nothing too simple about that process, right? But here we read that the time came she had a son. He makes it sound so easy. Well, church, it's written this way, I believe, because God wants us to know that there's nothing too hard for him to accomplish. Nothing too difficult for him creating the world and holding it all together that's not too difficult for God redeeming the world and reclaiming it for his own that's not too hard for him sending a baby boy through an old couple who can't have kids just another walk in the park for God nothing barrenness, old age sin, unbelief, death hell nothing will stand in the way of God fulfilling his promises to save and redeem his people for his glory isn't that good news church the moment you began believing in God you had to give up the idea of the impossible because nothing is impossible with God brothers and sisters these simple words in verse 57 remind us that what God has said he will do what he promises, he will bring to pass. It took Zechariah, the pastor. It took Zechariah, the pastor, nine hard months to learn this lesson. But eventually he did. We're going to see here in a minute. And I'm sure maybe there's some of you this morning. You're like Zechariah. You're having a hard time trusting in what God has said. I've been there before. You have a hard time trusting and believing what God has said. If you do, brothers and sisters, take courage. You're not alone. You're not alone in that. But remember, God is completely trustworthy. As the Bible says, he's not a man that he would lie. What he says, he will do. And so we can trust God's word because God's word is true. Verse 58, And her neighbors and her relatives heard what the Lord, the Lord had shown great mercy to Elizabeth. And they rejoiced with her. They're excited for her. What no one thought would happen, happened. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, the one everybody knows can't have children. She, she's had a son in her old age. And everybody's like, wow, the Lord has shown great mercy to her. They knew this was no ordinary event. God had to be involved. And so they rejoiced with her, with her at God's great mercy. And they were right to rejoice with her that God had been merciful to her. But what they didn't realize yet was that the Lord was showing them great mercy too. 
because they didn't know who this baby boy was. They didn't know that God was at work fulfilling his promises and preparing the way for a savior to come a savior who would extend God's mercy not just to this old couple Zachariah and Elizabeth but to the whole world that's what was on the way and so they rejoiced with her but they didn't know the extent to which they should be rejoicing yet verse 59 and 60 says that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zechariah after his father but his mother answered no his name is John circumcision was the sign of God's covenant relationship with his people in the Old Testament and so like the obedient Jews that Zechariah and Elizabeth were they take him to be circumcised on the eighth day and when it's time to name the baby everyone everyone's still hanging out because they're all still excited so they're all still hanging out everyone's excited and you know what they're expecting they're expecting Zachariah Jr. to be written on the birthday cake that's what they're looking for Zachariah Jr. on the birth certificate this is going to be his name but Elizabeth has to say in verse 60 no his, his, he shall be called John this shows that she trusts the Lord the angel said to them you shall name this boy John and so when she said that everybody looked at her like she was crazy all you moms out there don't you love this wouldn't you love this? You tell them what you're, what the, what you're naming the baby, and they're like, you're crazy. And nowadays, when someone is going to name their baby, and we wonder, huh, why? We just keep that to ourselves, right? Or we say, well, bless their little heart, which if you haven't figured this out yet, that is, that is not a good thing. That does not mean we're, we're condoning blessing there, right? But they just came out and said, John, John? No offenses to all the Johns in the room or those watching. John there, there isn't any Johns in your family that makes no sense and so here's some more evidence that God's at work in all this Elizabeth didn't reach across the table and slap all of them right it is interesting that they're all giving their opinion on what to name this baby boy but in that day this was typical and common to name the child after a father or a patriarch in the family and more than likely they're thinking they've waited so long they've waited so long and now they finally have a baby boy this is your chance this is your only chance to keep the family name Zachariah's name alive and so they all look in verse 62 they, they look over at Zachariah and they're like Zachariah you've got to talk some sense into your wife talk some sense into her but then they remember they're going to have to spell it out for him because he can't hear and so they do that and Zachariah asks for a pen and paper Zachariah gets that pen and paper, and what does he write? Verse 63. John is his name. Zachariah says he's already been named. Not by us, but by God. And when this happened, everyone was amazed. And Zechariah, his mouth is open and his tongue is loosed and he begins to bless and praise God for the first time in nine months. A lot of amazing things happening here. And there's lots that we could say. But if you're taking notes, here's point number one. God's mercy meant rejoicing for Zechariah and Elizabeth. God's mercy meant rejoicing for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Again, with this baby boy, everyone knew that God was up to something that the Lord has shown them great mercy. And no one knew this better than the ones who knew what was going on, and that was Zechariah and Elizabeth. And so they're leading the way in praising God. Now, if you think about it, this is incredible when you, when you think about it from Zechariah's point of view. Think about this with me for just a second. What would have been your first words to God after he took away your ability to speak or hear for nine months? What do you do when God rebukes you for your sin and unbelief? How do you handle the discipline of the Lord in your life? I can imagine that Zechariah maybe felt a little raw toward God at first. Maybe angry, maybe a little pouty. He probably gave God the silent treatment for a while. Some of you will get that later. I can imagine that Zechariah, after a few months of being just frustrated with God, picking back up his Bible and beginning to read 
and pray and think about all the things that God said that he would do to send a Savior into the world, to send a prophet who would become before that Savior to prepare people for him. He probably got to the point where he's thinking over this nine-month period, how could I have been so foolish? An angel is standing in front of me. How could I have been so foolish? How could I have missed what God was doing in the, in the world? I'm a preacher. I do this for a living. How could I have missed God's promises? Why did I not just trust God and take him at his word? But then I could imagine over time that he began to see what's happening with his wife Elizabeth and their cousin Mary. And he began to see what God was doing. And it all led to this moment, this day, when he's, he writes, his name is John, and he bursts out, not with, what in the world, God? Or, why, God? But, I bless you, God. I praise you, God. You are worthy, God. Church, as some have said, our sufferings and hard times will either make us bitter or they'll make us better. Our suffering and our hard times will either make us bitter or they'll make us better. They made Zechariah better. They made him better. As John Piper has said, Zechariah's silence may have been a divine rebuke for his unbelief, but God always turns his rebukes into rewards for those who keep faith. And so maybe you this morning, you're feeling the consequences of maybe some of your past sins, like Zechariah was. Or if for some unknown reason, God has chosen that this season of your life will not be one of ease and comfort, but pain, sorrow, and silence. If that's you, the answer is not to run away from God or get angry at Him. The answer is to run to God and hold fast to Christ, to keep trusting in Him because God loves to take scars caused by our sin, caused by a broken world. He loves to take those scars and turn them into signs of His grace. How many of you have some of those signs of grace in your life? And some of those He's still working in to perform and work those into signs of grace. Places where He does some of His greatest work in His people. It's through scars through nine months of silence. You see, with this outburst of praise, Zechariah shows us that his nine months of silence were not a waste. They were not a waste. They were not in vain. God had used the silence to teach him some really important lessons. And one of those lessons that we've already seen is that we can trust God's word because God's word is true. It's true, brothers and sisters. No matter what the world says, no matter what our heart says sometimes, God is true, and he speaks truth, and what he promises he will bring to pass. Nothing will stop him. Zechariah learned this, and it led him to rejoice in God. But through all this, Zechariah also learned something else that's important, and I think it's important for us, and that's God's a God of second chances. <laughs> Isn't that good news? As he says later, he doesn't just say mercy, he says the tender mercy of God. You see, although God had rebuked him for his unbelief, God didn't discard him and move on to the next person. Okay, Zechariah, you don't want to believe? All right, I'm going to go over here with this guy and his wife. He didn't do that, did he? Instead, God used nine months of silence as, he, as, as Zechariah watched his wife grow. He used nine months of silence to teach Zechariah that God is a God who is full of mercy toward those who struggle to trust in him. And that's good news for sinners like us who struggle to trust in God. Church, aren't you thankful for a God who is full of mercy toward those who struggle to trust in him? Aren't you thankful that he's a God of second and third and fourth and 400th and four million chances? Aren't you thankful for that? What if God was not a God full of grace and mercy? What if he wasn't patient with sinners who struggled to believe in him? Where would you be? Where would I be? Many people think that Christianity and the church is made up of the strong and the weak just don't make it. But it's actually the opposite, right? It's the opposite. The church is the home of weak, struggling sinners who realize that they're so weak, their only hope is to trust in the only strong one among us, and that's Jesus, right? 
Our hope as God's people is not in our strength, but in the strength of our Savior. We need a God who is full of grace and mercy, a God of second chances, a God who where the sin and unbelief of his people just abounds. His grace abounds all the more. That's the Savior we need, and that's the Savior God is. Zechariah learned this about God's tender mercy in nine months of silence. And so his first words after all that time were not to curse the God who made him suffer, but to praise him, to bless him, to rejoice in him. Are you suffering this morning? God has not forgotten about you in those moments of silence. He's actually doing a great work in you to produce something for his glory that never would have happened unless you would have went through that. God's mercy meant rejoicing for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And then in verses 65 through 66, we see that when Zechariah busted out in praise to God, the people around him were like, whoa! Whoa! They were, they were full of awe and they were full of fear. How would you respond if a guy who hasn't said a word in nine months just burst out and starts praising God right next to you in your ear? You'd probably be a little afraid too, right? This is what's going on with these people. They're, they're full of awe and wonder at what's going on. And the Bible says that, that what, what happened that day with Zachariah and Elizabeth and this baby boy was the talk of the town. I grew up in a small town. Word travels fast. Word was traveling fast. People were laying these things up in their heart and they were going, what in the world is going on? What is going to happen with this baby boy? They knew God was up to something. And as we said earlier, they just didn't know what all God was up to. They didn't realize that with the birth of this baby boy, the Lord was showing them great mercy too. This baby boy was a sign from God that help was on the way that God was at work after 400 years of silence from Malachi to this day that God was at work that he had not forgotten that his mercy was about to bust loose and his salvation was close at hand Zechariah knew this and so inspired by the Holy Spirit he sings about it in verses 67 through 79 let's read those verses together Zechariah said, verse 67, his father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesied, saying this, Blessed be the Lord. He just can't stop. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, speaking of John, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of his salvation, of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way. If you're taking notes, here's point number two. God's mercy means salvation for God's people. God's mercy means salvation for God's people. In this song, Zechariah tells us that God in his mercy has sent salvation to his people. In the first three verses of this song, verses 68 through 70, Zechariah tells us about God's plan, his plan of salvation. He says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He's visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. Just as he said, just as he spoke he would uh, by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. So in these first three verses, Zechariah is praising God and thanking him for doing exactly what he promised he would do in the Old Testament. And that was to send a Savior who would save his people by forgiving them of their sins 
That's what he's talking about in verse 69. You see that in verse 69 where he says, God has raised up a horn of salvation from us, for us from the house of David. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of or picture a horn, the horn of a bull or an ox. Here's what comes to my mind. I picture me and my family at Lazy Five Ranch and my son screaming his head off because there's a giant cow trying to stick his head into the window to get that little food. That's what I picture when I think of a horn. But in those days, there was no Lazy Five Ranch. No, just, in those days, the giant horn of a bull represented strength and power. And so when Zechariah speaks of a horn of salvation, he means this. God has sent a mighty salvation, or God has raised up a strong Savior to redeem his people. And he says this, this guy is coming from the house of David, a fulfillment of God's promises and covenants in the Old Testament, he says in verses 72 and 73. All that language lets us know that this Savior was none other than the promised Messiah, the one God had been talking about the whole Old Testament. Since Genesis chapter 3 when he said, I'm going to send a son who's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's the one, the only one who can save Zachariah and Elizabeth, their baby boy, and all of us. He's the horn of salvation. Zachariah is seeing all of this. He sees what God's doing and he explodes in excitement because he knows, he knows he doesn't deserve it. I blew my chance nine months ago, he thinks. Our people blew our chances over and over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Why would God put up with us? And yet here God is sending us a Savior to rescue us. He explodes in blessing and praise to God. He's not forgotten his promises. Friend, in, in case you're unfamiliar with the story of the Bible, I was for so long, and I'm still trying to get my head around all of it. It's a big book with lots of little books. It has lots of things in there. It's hard to understand. In case you're unfamiliar, though, with the overarching story of the Bible from beginning to end, it, it's not the story of people making great promises to God and us keeping them. It's just not. It's the story of God making great promises to people and God keeping all of them. The Bible is not the story of God of, of us doing great things for God. It's not. It's the story. Whew, it's the story of God doing great things for us. When we cannot save ourselves, God raised up a strong Savior to save us, who would rescue us from our sin and restore our relationship to God. And that Savior was not John. Zechariah's not singing about John, he's singing about Jesus. Jesus Christ. As we look down at verse 77, we see that in verse 77, the main way that Jesus saves us is by forgiving us of our sins. Forgiving us of our sins. Friend, I don't, I don't know what you, you think your greatest need in the world is. Food, water, to be teleported out of 2020 somehow. Here's what God says your greatest need is. You need to be forgiven of your sin against God that's your greatest need in all the world you need to be forgiven of your sin against God and you might not have known this I didn't know this for a long time but you and I we were all made by God and we were made for God by him and for him and God made us to know him to love him enjoy him forever that's, that's our purpose in life but the Bible says that all of us, we've all rejected God's plans for us. We've all rejected his purpose for us. And none of us has done what he made us to do. The Bible calls that sin. Sin. And because God is good and holy and perfect, he's holding us accountable for how we live our lives. I know we don't like to think about it, but the Bible says there's coming a day when we will stand before the God who made us and give an account to him for how he used the life he gave to us. How have we spent it? He's holding us accountable for our sins. And it gets worse. Because the Bible tells us that if our sins against God are not forgiven, God will punish us for our sins forever on that day. That's not good news. So why is Zechariah singing? Because there's good news that comes after that bad news. 
You want to know something amazing, friend? The same God that you and I have sinned against our whole lives is the same God who will judge us. He's the same God who came for us. As Michael prayed what it go, not to pay us back, but to win us back. God has sent a strong Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ the Lord, and He's come to forgive you of your sins. That's why He came. Jesus came to take the sins of all of His people, to die for them in, his, in our place. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, He wasn't dying for His sin against God. He didn't have any. He didn't have any to pay for. He went to the cross. He was dying for the sin of all who will turn from their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ. And how do we know this is true? Three days later, God raised his son from the dead. He ascended into heaven, never to die again, so that he could prove to us, if you trust in my son, you can be forgiven. Oh, friend, don't you want to be forgiven of your sins? Why would you not want to be forgiven of your sins? God has made a way for you to be forgiven. God has made, not me, not some other person. God has made a way for you and me, for us to be forgiven of our sins, to have your sins against him forgiven. He sent a Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, friend, come to him. Come to Christ. Turn from your sin. Place your faith in Jesus that he died for your sins, that he paid the penalty for you. Receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. If you have questions about that, please talk with somebody you came with, or there's plenty of Christians in here. They'd love to tell you more about that good news story. Or if you're watching online, feel free to send us an email or talk to some Christians that you know. There's nothing greater you could receive this Christmas than forgiveness of your sins and eternity with God. And we invite you to come to know Christ. And brothers and sisters, aren't you thankful for a strong Savior? And when he died, death could not hold him. Hell could not hold him. He's able to forgive you, not just of some of your sins, but all of them. He's able to make you righteous before God. He's able to save you forever. He's a strong Savior. As Zechariah sings about, he talks about all these prophecies and covenants and promises. The Bible is a big book that covers a long period of time. Don't forget, from beginning to end, it's the story of God and what he's doing to save and rescue sinners through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Zechariah found out, what God promises, he will carry out. He promised a Savior and a strong Savior he sent. What would this salvation mean for God's people? He goes on in verses 71 through 75 to tell us about God's purposes for salvation. God's purposes, he said that he saved us, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham in Genesis 12, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, we might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. In these verses, Zechariah shows us that there's multiple aspects to why God saves his people. One of them is a physical aspect. He says there in verses 71 through 74, he says, Zechariah pictures salvation from Jesus, the Messiah, as being from our enemies, from the hands of all those who hate us. Zechariah probably had in mind here a deliverance from Rome. A political, physical rescue out from under Rome who was harshly ruling over them at the time. Just as God had delivered his people from Egypt and many other places in the Old Testament, Zechariah knows that the time is coming when God will deliver all of his people and we will, we will reign with Christ under this new king. He knows that time's coming. But that time is still in the future, even for us, Right? A day of peace like no other is coming, but we're waiting on Christ to return and finish what he started. But Zechariah also knew there was a spiritual aspect to God's salvation. He knew that the main goal there in verses 74 and 75 is that God saved us so that we might serve him. So that we might serve him. Church, do you know why God has saved and rescued you? So that you might serve him. Fearlessly in holiness and in righteousness all your days. God did not just send his son to set the captives free. 
He sent his son to turn those who were captives to sin into servants of Christ. He set us free from sin to him so that we might serve him now, love him now, enjoy him now forever. God has been about this from the very beginning. And this is what he's doing even now through the church. He's proclaiming the gospel through his people so that more and more captives to sin might be set free and they might become sons and daughters of God, worshiping him, serving him. So friend, I just wonder, is this true of you? We, we live in a town, in a culture where it's very easy to say, I believe in Jesus. But I'm not asking if you, if you believe in Jesus per se. I'm asking, have you started serving Jesus? Is there fruit that backs up your profession of faith? And it's not perfection, but it is a new direction. God is creating a people for himself who don't just acknowledge that he's there. They serve him with their lives this is God's purpose in salvation so we've seen the plan of salvation the purpose next Zechariah tells us about the prophet of salvation look there at verse 76 and 77 he says in you child John you'll be called the prophet of the most high for you'll go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of his salvation salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins for the first time in this song the first time Zechariah addresses his son did you notice that you might have expected the whole song to be about him they've waited a long time why not write a song about him right but it wasn't it was mainly about God and what he was doing to save the world through this strong savior but now Zechariah does turn to his son and he addresses him directly and he, he tells us we learn John will be great just like the angel said. John will be great. There hasn't been a prophet in Israel for years, and yet John will be called the prophet of the Most High, the prophet of the Lord. John would be the fulfillment of what God said 400 years earlier through the prophet Malachi, Malachi 3 and 4. Malachi, in the Old Testament, had, where God had said that he would send a messenger to go before his Messiah to prepare his people for his coming. And here we learn John's going to be that promised child. I thought my kids were pretty special because when they color, they stay in the lines. But here we read of a baby boy who was promised 400 years before he ever came, saying that he would prepare the way for the Lord. This is a special child. I think if they had Facebook and Instagram, he'd probably be all over it, right? You would think. Zachariah and Elizabeth knew they had a special child, a child a child who would go before the Savior of the world. And yet they also knew, I think this is informative for us, they also knew as great as their child was, he was not the point. He was a pointer. He was a pointer. As we read in verse 77, John would not save anyone from their sin, but he would prepare people for the one who could save them. John would make things ready for the Savior by teaching them how they could be forgiven of their sins. Brothers and sisters, I think John is a great picture of what every follower of Christ is to be like. The point of John's life was not John, it was Jesus. The point of my life and your life of followers of Jesus is not us, it's Jesus. And we're all like big index pointer fingers, right? Pointing the way away from us and to Jesus about that Savior. And so a Christian is someone who is okay with not being the point of their lives. Are you okay with not being the point of your life? Parents, I wonder sometimes, like Zachariah and Elizabeth, are we okay raising our kids to see that they're not the point of their lives either? As it has been said, only one person can be large in your life. Is it you or Jesus? Who's it going to be? Zachariah knew that the point of his life and the point of his son was to point others to the Savior. And that's the point of our lives too. And that brings us to the last part of Zechariah's song where he talks about the why of salvation. Why would God do this? Verse 78 and 79, look there. Why is God doing this? Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
why was God doing all this? Why was he fulfilling these promises to Israel of sending a Savior to forgive them of their sin? Was he doing it because Israel was worthy? Was he doing it because he knew that they were the only ones who would believe him if he actually came to the world as a baby boy? If you remember, when Jesus finally came and grew up, it was his own people who rejected him and hated him so much that they crucified and killed him. You would have thought if anyone is going to welcome God's son to the world, surely it's God's people. And yet even they hated him and killed him. And so why would God send his son to save a world that he knew would end up killing his son? The answer, because of the tender mercy of God. See verse 78? Because of the tender mercy of God. Friend, do you know what mercy is? Do you know what mercy is? Mercy is God looking at sinners, and instead of giving us what we deserve, he gives us what we don't deserve instead. It's God looking at a world full of people who have turned their back on him, and instead of wiping us all out, he created the world in seven days. He could ball it up like a piece of paper and throw it away if he wanted to any moment. It's God looking at a world who have turned their back on him, and instead of coming after us to wipe us all out, he comes after us to win us all back. Not through our death, through his. This is the amazing news of the gospel. We sin, we rebel against God. Who ends up on the cross? God. God does. Because of his tender mercy. I love how Zechariah describes it in verses 78 and 79. He says, When God looked out on the world, this is what he saw a people wrecked by their sin, they were sitting in darkness. And so he sent them the light of his salvation. He saw people languishing in the shadow of death. And so he sent his son to give us life. He saw people who had no peace. And he sent his son to make a way of peace, a way for us to have peace with God. Friends, this is what God has done for us. Not because we deserve it. But because he's full of mercy and compassion. Church, aren't you thankful for the tender mercy of our God? that he would bring us out of darkness and into his light. If you know God, this is your testimony. You've been brought out of darkness into light. You've been rescued out of death and been given life. You who had no peace with God have now been given peace with God, a peace that Jesus said passes all understanding. It's a peace that the world can't give to you. It's a peace that the world can't take away. It's a peace with God that only he can give. God's tender mercy meant rejoicing for Zachariah and Elizabeth and it means salvation for God's people and friend God's mercy can mean salvation for you too if you will see and recognize that you need God's mercy you see the hope of Christ at Christmas reminds us that even though we're all sinful and worthy God has come to save us anyway anyway <laughs> And his mercy is available for all who will see that they need it. And so are you a sinner? Friend, if you are, your sins must be forgiven. Or they will be punished forever. Do you see your need for God's mercy? If so, God has sent you a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. We thank you so much together as your people for your tender mercy God we are a people in desperate need of your tender mercy we are not those who have, who have done great things for you you are the one who has done great things for us and I pray Lord that we would celebrate like Zachariah and Elizabeth that we would just sing and celebrate and thank you God for the great mercy that you have shown us through Jesus your son and Father, I pray for those who are listening now or who might listen later. I pray, Lord, if they do not know your Son, the Savior of the world, I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes, their ears, their hearts, that you would help them to see their need for your forgiveness. And then, Lord, help them to see the Savior that you sent to forgive them. We love you, Father. We praise you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.